Uh, we have a scripture passage, and then I'll get started, uh, and I'll introduce our, our speakers for today. This is from Luke chapter 4, where Jesus was in Nazareth. And uh, I've been to Nazareth, and I've also been to other places in Galilee, Capernaum, and, where there is a synagogue that has, it's really interesting, it, uh, the lower part of the synagogue is built out of black basalt rock, which is the local rock from the area. And then the upper part of the synagogue is built out of white marble, which was imported much later. Uh, so you can see the layers there. And of course, Capernaum is a dead town. There's nobody living there now. It's just those monuments, memorials, uh, some archeological artifacts that have been dug up. But of course, Jesus, told us about that, right? He predicted that, that, that would, Capernaum didn't listen to him, and so that's where they ended up. <laughs> uh, verse 16, then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went, as usual, to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures, and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll, and found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover, recovery of sight to the blind, <laughs> to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him. As he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today, as you've heard it being read. Word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we do thank you for your word and for the power that it has and the authority that it has coming from our Lord. And we pray that you'll guide us and help us to understand it, to obey it, to uh, learn how to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So today we are going to hear about the implications of the genetic testing, the technology involved with uh, the new emerging uh, field of uh, synthetic biology, DNA, recombinant DNA, the uh, ethical issues surrounding the new biology. Lots of things that are happening uh, and is uh, happening very rapidly. Uh, and so uh, we have two of our most illustrious, experienced wrestlers <laughs> who have wrestled with us about these questions. Uh, Dr. Ann White, Cyril Draffin, who you all know, and we appreciate their chance to share with us. So I'm just going to turn it over to them. We're starting a little bit early, so we'll have a couple minutes at the end. I'd like to come in and uh, wrap it up and tell you about uh, the plans for the next term. So, thank you guys. Maybe coming. we'll wrestle with each other, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, is this microphone picking up my voice? Okay, very good. Francis Collins, who was the head of the Human Genome Project, and now, I believe, is the head of NIH. People are nodding their heads, yes. yes. Has spoken of the science and technology of genetics in the context of Jesus' healing ministry. He has related it to that healing ministry, and we as Christians who want to follow the biblical witness understand that Jesus' healing ministry is part of the context of what we are commanded to do. However, the context, the biblical context for us is not simple. The biblical context isn't simple for anything in life. It is not simple here in this complex area. And to say that Jesus' healing ministry is part of it is extremely true. It's very true, but it's incomplete. Paul read Jesus' proclamation that he had come to help the poor. Part of the biblical context for our lives as Christians is 
Our call to care for the poor, the powerless, the disabled, the retarded, the unlovely, the weak, as Jesus did. That is the biblical witness. To connect with something I talked about when I taught before in March about a medical technology issue, uh, maternal surrogacy, children are among the powerless. Jesus came to help the poor and the powerless, so must we. Children are among the powerless, and yet it has become a common practice for those using IVF, donor sperm and donor eggs, and I told you before, donor is a term of art. It doesn't mean they're given. It's a big business. They're sold. To peruse files of the potential donors to figure out how they can maybe have kids that are of the intelligence level or the athleticism <laughs> level that they would like to have, thus not protecting the powerless children, but instead making these children tools of their own egos. So, Cyril is going to speak about this complicated and very exciting field of genetic testing now, but I wish that you would keep in mind as you listen to him the question, whether or not what you're hearing reinforces or takes away from, diminishes, our reservoir of compassion for and our commitment to helping the poor and the powerless, the disabled, the weak, the retarded, the unlovely. Cyril, we're ahead of our schedule. <laughs> The world's a complex place, and I'm sure we'll have lots of things to think about. Um, so my role is to talk about genetic testing and the implications of getting those results and genetic treatments that are available. It's a challenging and fast-moving area. I have show and tell this for you, all of which are from this month uh, in terms of things that are happening in this area. Um, it's, as uh, Ann mentioned, it raises a number of ethical issues. It raises some challenges. Um, you've heard in the past about the complexity of life, and you know, David Socrates gave a lot of details on how that evolved. And in many cases, we've been watching life develop. Here's an opportunity to perhaps change life <coughs> before it develops. That's a new paradigm. So I'd like you to think about these issues, and I have um, four major points to make. First, you and your DNA are very complex <coughs> and very exciting and you change. And you're, so what does that mean? Uh, you, just everybody probably knows background on the human genome, but I'll just read a couple things just for those to get you today. It's uh, encoded with DNA sequences uh, within the 23 chromosome pairs of cell nuclei. Small DNA molecules are found within individual mitochondria. Um, those genomes, both the egg, the sperm, um, consist of 3 million DNA base pairs. So you're pretty complicated. And people kind of evaluated them. And there was a term of art called, well, we had the important DNA, and then we had the junk DNA. <laughs> well, actually, that junk DNA may not be as junky as we thought. And there's a lot of complexity to that. Um, so the first point is it's very detailed, and it takes a lot of coordinated, well-coordinated action, actions in your body to work, to function, to digest, to learn, to remember, to convey information, to find information from the, your past, to make judgments. Those are genetic characteristics that make you different. You might have noticed that the people next to you look different than you, um, and you are different. Um, and there's lots of different capabilities you have, and there's also people that have inherent advantages. Some people can understand and process information better. Some people have color deficiencies. Some people have major medical problems that are a result of just a couple genes that went wrong. So let's go back. Remember, David Silkris said that, you know, he pointed out the importance of genes and said that uh, 
a microbe with the DNA <clears throat> was our common ancestor. That means everybody in this room, that means kind of everything that's alive that's on this earth came from a microbe with DNA that developed over time with complexity and th certain things were developed and didn't work and those kind of died out and certain things did work. And so this vast complexity that we're just beginning to understand. So first point, we are complex. And we are just, every year there's new technologies and new understanding and the, with large amounts of data processing that gives us an understanding we never had before. Second point, technology advances make the cost of assessing DNA in individuals affordable. So people will have a lot more information some of that information will be good, and they'll learn stuff and be able to treat it. And some people will go, uh-oh, I actually have a risk factor for this disease I don't have yet, but luckily I could worry about it the rest of my life. <laughs> so is information a good thing? It certainly can be very valuable. And so each of you will have to ponder that question, what kind of information would you want to know about your future? If you knew what was going to happen to you, would that be better? If you knew about your children or grandchildren and all, saw that they had a genetic disease, was that something that make you, oh, and now I know I can treat it, or now I, I have to worry about it? And so there's questions of information. In the past, there's been genetic tests for male and female. There are certain implications, you know, and certainly in Asia, people, uh, if you find you have a male, that's great. If you have a female, not so good, and sometimes they don't get around to being born. Um, there's companies like uh, 23andMe that have run 800,000 DNA tests, I understand. And uh, you've heard of something called National Geographic. National Geographic, which you should probably think of as just on the forefront of the most advanced cutting technology you ever heard of. <laughs> well, they have an explorer residence and they have over half a million people have taken part in Ge National Geographic's groundbreaking geographic project, contributed real sign scientific effort and learn about yourself. And so they have a test, which you can take a little cheek swab, send it in and submit your DNA, and um, they will then give you a little this DNA kit, and they'll gather information about your heritage. So when Ge National Geographic's getting in the game of running DNA tests, what do you think about some other more sophisticated scientific groups? So th the point is that there's a lot of people thinking about this and running tests. Um, there are genetic tests done for Down syndrome, early onset familial uh, Alzheimer's. Um, you've probably heard of BRCA1 and BRCA2 tests for breast cancer. Um, these are have major impacts. Um, if you, uh, let's say there's a company called uh, Myriad Genetics. Um, they have this little chip you can, you know, do this and they run little tests. They have about 100 people per day that send in their DNA tests, women that want to see whether they have BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. They have, um, just with that one little test, they have revenues of $740 million per year. One test. And a lot of people act on it. You know, some people do bold things because they think they have this test. You read out some of the papers. I won't be too graphic, but they do that. That's an example of just one company and one test. Other companies are coming out, NVIDIA, uh, they, by the way, they've screened about 1.5 million people. Uh, they have uh, another company, NVIDIA, raised $102 million in February, and their test now cost $1,500 to test mutations in 220 genes that they consider the most relevant. Um, and uh, there are details um, on that, and so what it is, that they're, it's somewhat cost effective to run these tests. And there's better data, there's better analysis. It, the, it's not just running the test, but saying, so what? And you need to run correlations, running back to data for the health and medical benefit histories of these people to then tell you what the impact of those gene variations are. So I have a question for you. I have a couple questions for you in this class, um, because you get to participate. Uh, the, uh, how many in the class have had a DNA test either for themselves or their family or they know someone that has been a friend that's had a DNA test. Um, it used to be it cost, you know, the Human Genome Project cost big bucks. 
Now you can get them for a thousand dollars and they have details that are quite specific and they can tie them to doctors and they also have questions. Reads us to the second point. What do you do with the data? The drugs and personalized medicine therapies will enable some genetically impacted diseases to be treated. So what do I mean by that? Some people think that the impact of uh, these kind of genetic modifications are to this century what vaccines, you know, think polio vaccines, were to the previous century. That's significant. When you have places like the uh, another well-known technical publication, AARP Bulletin, <laughs> also from A, saying, you know, we get 150 medications for which DNA screenings can help avert uh, futile treatments and adverse reactions and predict which drugs will work. And so therefore, it'll take certain gene variations will identify people who don't respond to certain antidepressants and they can, uh, a genetic test can help doctors provide the optimum dosage for blood thinner warfarin. So, these are tests that they're recommending you take to help your current medical condition. When groups like that are recommending it, it's becoming more widespread. Um, if there's a faulty gene for a blood cell with sickle cell anemia or Huntington's disease, um, that's the agent will cause a fatal brain condition with just one uh, copy from either male or female, the husband, father, or mother. So it doesn't take very much in some cases to cause a major genetic problem. There are new technologies in um, synthetic biology that Paul mentioned, um, enabling, in fact, when MIT put out a listing what the major ones, and all this this month, um, Future Proof Zone, major R&D, they listed one on synthetic biology, which basically says you can design all of the DNA found in every living cell, um, there are ways of doing genetic manipulations of it. There you can, there's um, ways of turning viruses on and off, and I'll mention one of the technologies uh, right now. And so it's a whole class of research that's being done at major universities, synthetic biology. You can, from the title, you can pretty much figure out what they're trying to do. Um, there are, um, New technologies developed. I point out to you, CRISPR. Um, anybody who's heard of CRISPR technology, by the way? Okay, you will hear about this. It's about three years old, and uh, Paul was trying to memorize it this today, so I have to keep reading it to him to, to get it. It's the um, clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats, <laughs> um, and then it's associated with protein number nine. So, what's the big deal? The big deal is that um, little bacteria, which are really pretty smart things, they look around and find a little virus attacking them. So what they do is they grab a little piece of that code, that virus code, put it in their own DNA for the, in the bacteria, and when the virus comes back again, it's ready for it, because it's get it out here. Well, that technology people have played with and manipulated, and basically, I won't go through the science right now, but you can change the individual, get down to the individual parts of the gene and to turn it on and turn it off and modify. It has that degree of specificity. That it, and because of that technology, only three years old, it's a groundbreaker. And so, does anybody hear about this? Well, let's say New York Times. So, New York Times, um, this is one of the two uh, women, um, Dudra. Uh, she would basically worked down the University of California, so she was, they called her the gene editor. And so she basically worked on this CRISPR technology. Hold that up for the video. <laughs> and, and hold up the video, and we'll get there. Um, and uh, but I would, just in case people don't have the genetic modifications to see perfectly yet, um, <laughs> that um, this basically is technology um, which is going to be used to alter the genes in the human embryo, and that has significance because if let's say you're treating someone with a an anema, a gene that causes anemia, and so therefore you can die and you treat the blood, you process the blood and put it back in the person's body and they get better. If you have a gene, you're changing the stem cell, making a genetic modification, that works for that individual and that works for that, the progeny of that individual. All the children, they're online, anybody they have the rest of their genetic life and their children's life and their grandchildren's life. And so making those changes are a big deal. And this technology allows that to be done. And there's two scientists um, that are kind of fighting over the patent for it. And so I was uh, talking to the president of one of the companies, uh, 
couple weeks ago at MIT, um, and because the other guy came out of MIT. And they basically, uh, this is a company called um, EDITAS Medicine, and they're starting with ex vivo blood processing and also ophthalmic, because in that nerve it's very kind of controlled and it, the genes don't go anywhere. But the next step is to take them somewhere. So we'll make that, get to that in a moment. But by editing the DNA of children that are born, um, you may be able to improve their outcomes. Um, and there are, um, there may be alternatives. I mean, in certain cases in Huntington's disease, you can have a sperm. In Huntington's disease, if you have the bad gene, you get Huntington's disease, and that's a big problem. And half the, the children would have it, half wouldn't. So one technique is, okay, you could take the sperm of that uh, male and fertilize a dozen of his partner's eggs, find the ones that were had the disease and kind of destroy those eggs and then pick ones that were good to use them. So you don't have to do any genetic modification, you just know about it. But you know that's going to start raising some ethical questions, which you know I'm sure Anne's going to want to join in with. Um, there are a whole bunch of special genes for inherited blood disease. And by the way, I'll hold up the picture here, but in case you're wondering what the CRISPR tech looks like, um, <laughs> um, this is what it is. It's kind of it's complex. It's, it's like a, it's an, it's it has a three dimensional characteristic of the way these things work. And so these are all very seriously complex operations. Yeah. So the that company Editas, the name comes from edit. Is that right? Editing genes. Is that what they call yeah. it? With that? Okay. And everything you've been talking about with co in connection with that has the potential to change progeny it can. in the future. Yes. So, and that is what, you know, I read those articles about Dr. Doudna. Someone is quoted as saying, this has the potential to change evolution. Is that a fair statement? Is that what that means, what you're talking about? Okay, so I, so let's review the, I guess I'm gonna answer that directly. So okay. first point, you and your genetic DNA are really complex. Second of all, there's a lot of tests out there and they're getting better during their analysis. Third is, Technology advances make the um, medical therapies possible. The fourth one is the ability to modify DNA, particularly in germ lines, just what you're saying for the ovum sperm, will have major method, uh, ethical challenges because it'll affect progeny for years. So let's just pull in, let's pick today's, this month's view of MIT Technology Review. Um, <laughs> I'd like someone to help read the title for me. We can now engineer the human race. <laughs> is that provocative enough? <laughs> um, and so the answer is yes. That, that enables this to be done, to change the genes. Um, that is evolution. It's evolution. I mean, people have done genetic modifications in agriculture, and some people get a little concerned about that. Um, but when you put it into uh, people, which have long-term impacts, um, that has more of an impact. Um, so they've certainly done some of the testing in the pigs and cattle, but if you do these things, you can get rid of things, scourges like uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, you can um, do changes, so, but, so the question would be, well, has anybody could try this? Well, the answer is yes. So I just happen to be wearing a Chinese tie, um, because in China, um, there is this, um, person who ran these tests to try to change, um, to modify a stem cell, that's that base pair that has a genetic impact, um, of inherited blood disease that caused anemia. Now it didn't work, um, and he, but he published it in uh, um, Protein in the Cell, I think. Uh, he was turned down by Science and Color other magazines um, because they had some questions. but. Those tests are being done. There's at least four different labs in China. There's a couple, there's at least two or three in the US that are running these kinds of tests now. 12 countries have banned it. The United States allows it, China allows it. Uh, it being testing and modifications of stem cells. The American Medical Association has some kind of prohibitions on doing some of these things, but they were written in 1996 before anybody was able to do it. So then they're you know, not that enforceable. Um, so there's, I would like to point out risks and then turn it over to Anne to talk about some of the things. Some of, 
just because you fix one gene doesn't mean that's the only gene you've modified. And they turn out it's only about 40% successful, they think. And it also ha makes some changes in other parts of the gene, which you might not find out about until days, months, years, decades, generations later. And so what they're doing now is trying to figure out where does it pop up over here to solve that problem so it not pop up over there. So you don't make the changes you don't want to make, you don't want the changes you do want to make, but how can you be sure? That sort of reminds me of regression testing in like uh, computer science, like going back and saying, yeah. how's it affect the previous? <laughs> Making a change and seeing what it affects to your current version. And it may work, it may be safer with chickens than let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to ask you a question. <laughs> Um, how many of you approve genetic modification of babies that have, that have a serious risk of a serious disease that might kill them? And there's been some te genetic testing and they found out there might be a genetic problem. And so how many people favor um, genetic modifications of babies to kind of get around having a baby have a disease? I'd like to show of hands and say yes. I like to have a show of hands and say no. Okay, um, you're about consistent with the country. Uh, <laughs> the Pew study said about 46% or about half of the people said yes, it was okay to make genetic modifications of babies. Okay, second question. How many of you think that genetic modifications to make a baby smarter, more intelligent, would be taking medical advances too far? How many people think that would be going too far? How many people think that that wouldn't be going too far? Okay. Um, and according to the Pew, for about 83% said it would be going too far, and um, obviously the different 17% said that that would be, it'd be a good thing to do. Um, so let me pause there and open up to questions on this topic. I could go on for a long time with more details but um, on the dialogue of this genetic issue. So um, I'll start there and uh, work sir, with Paul. that last question implies that we know what makes people smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe I should say the word better because they're tests, but, but there are certain genes that they can tell that really have very strong bones. And that's probably a good thing. There are certain genes that, you know, that looks like it's going to, because they've run it in Icelandic tests and other places, that those people of those genes don't get Alzheimer's. And so there are certain genes that you can point to that make people better, if not smarter. The problem I had with your first question is not the question itself, but the implications of the next step. If you're able to do what you said, then what? What happens? It's the science and the and and uh, industry, if you will, are never content with stopping there. They want to go to the next step. And if you have success in the first, it goes right off from there. And uh, that's what bothered me in answering the question is, should we even start that? <clears throat> right, that's why we went, we're having this class, because we want you to be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Cyril. This is really great. Um, what I'm sitting here thinking about is my history. I'm remembering that Hitler started, uh, or some of the doctors back in that time, yeah. started uh, genetic research. So it's not a modern day phenomenon. It's, it's gone back a, a while. So it, um, it's really, um, I think for me, a concern about, um, and as a Christian, knowing that if we took this procedure or this process for the good, uh, we're all still dealing with a sin factor. As a Christian, I believe that. And so the struggle is going to be, what if someone says, well, only blue-eyed children should be born, and let's modify, or only, and they select out. Um, and then there's a danger, I think, in, in then um, uh, having that sense of um, a sort of a demigod that now we can change um, not only human beings, but we can change the course of time. So it, it, I guess it goes with what you're saying also. It spins out and we don't know where it's going to lead. So I'll be interested to hear Anne's um, the ethical dilemmas because you can't separate that out. It's all of that and then there's the question of money. 
what happens if only the rich people and only the rich societies can afford these genetic modifications. Yeah, on that last show of hands, I think that had to do with uh, changes in uh, mental capacity and so on, is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, the, or the potential ability for it. Important factor uh, would be the risk involved. I mean, I could just hear the doctor or the technician saying, well, now we can't guarantee, of course, just exactly what's going to happen, but 90% chance it's going in that direction. Uh, but what about the risks of uh, going badly in the other direction? I mean, that, that would be a big factor on my show of hands. Uh, that is a major issue. Um, because um, there, you're, no one's going to give you a guarantee. No one knows. And you've probably got to sign lots of, lots of medical forms and <laughs> legal forms saying you know, can't hold them responsible. Um, but it's a major challenge, and it becomes maybe less of a challenge if you're dealing with a sick <coughs> kid with a genetic problem that can be fixed in that one individual, and that person's going to die yeah. or be saved based on the genetic test working for that person, that child or adult. Yeah. It's a lot different if you're making a genetic modification in a stem line that something could go wrong and you can't really go back five years later and say you've got this problem now we need to really actually need to kill you um, and certainly you can't have any children anymore because it's going to be a problem so major problem we'll take a, just a couple more questions then we're going to turn it over to Ann well there are two levels oh yeah, you had a question like Bruce gets to go <laughs> uh, every scientific advance has risks and has good potential good and bad effects as we understand good and bad. The question about that Elise uh, raised in her interesting point, whether we are playing God, uh, would not one say that uh, medicine in saving lives through techniques that simply did not live, exist before is saving lives that is, would not have been God's plan. They would have died. So you have that whole set of issues uh, that, that come to the fore. We're playing God whether we like to or not. And the third, uh, I think as much as anything, is the what is the process for making the decisions about go, no go, in any of these devices and techniques and, that we're talking about? Um. And the question is, is it God's plan for us to have these developments in technologies to then make these modifications, or is that not his plan? So there's a bigger question on top of that. Um, there is a thought about how do you set up these standards. And so there is a, um, a group that um, was done, it's called the ALSIMAR conference that held in 1975, where biologists got together to do with a new technology called recombinant DNA, and they made some standards of what was acceptable and what wasn't. The thought was, should there be the same kind of thing for germline engineering, a national, worldwide discussion of what's the right thing to do? Because right now it's just in the R&D stage, it's not being applied clinically. But um, that's a major question, and we should handle it. Um, but when we're going to talk about whether we're playing God, I think it's time to bring Ann up. <laughs> um, because I think it gets to the question of Christian faith and uh, some of the ethical questions that we have, as you've already raised. So Ann, do you want to pick up on that? <laughs> yeah, I don't think the phrase playing God is very helpful as an intellectual category. Um, and I'll say in a minute why I think just using the word ethics isn't either. First of all, let me ask this question. Is there anyone here who disagrees that in addition to healing, care for the poor and the powerless is a biblical witness to which we're commanded to respond. Is there anyone who disagrees with that? If you do, say so. We need to be honest and discuss these things. I suspect there are people in this congregation who really don't agree with that. But nobody in here this morning, or at least you won't say so. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I want to talk about things that refer to Don's and Elisa's questions and comments. You'll see the context. Remembering the context of caring for the poor and the powerless, as well as healing. I want to talk about social expectations. For example, this is a very basic example. Before the car was invented, 
one used a horse for private transportation, personal transportation. When the car was invented, there was a period of time, I don't know the history well enough to know how long it lasted, when you could use either. You can't use either now. That's a social expectation. No one can choose to ride a horse to work. That's the development of social expectation. We as Christians, as well as everyone else, need to be conscious of that, though oftentimes people aren't conscious. It happens, we don't think about it until it's happened. The use of email. 25 years ago, maybe even 20, there was not a social expectation that you needed to keep up with your email. Was there? Is there now? Yes, there is. Social expectation. Now, to what extent is it, to go back to something I said earlier, and to get into the issues that have been raised here, it is already considered usual, if not expected, that people will use IVF, donor sperm and donor eggs, and read files about people giving the eggs and the sperm to find people that match, appear to match the kind of children they want to have. Powerless children, they're the powerless. The parents who are doing that, and what Cyril is talking about, will make it give us more sophisticated ways to do that than just reading the files and hoping for the sperm and the eggs to give you a blue-eyed child or a very smart child or a very tall child. But as I said earlier, powerless, those children are the tools of their parents' egos. They are commodities ordered up. And so a child, you either don't tell the child and live a lie, or you tell the child, and the child is in the position then of saying, oh, you wanted somebody to be smart, uh-huh. Am I smart enough? Do you love me because I'm smart enough? Am I really what you wanted? Think about the social expectations that come when people do that constantly so that it's expected that people do it. What effect does that have? Or what would be the case if it becomes so common, so that it's expected. One mother says to her friend, well, you could have tested for Down syndrome. You didn't have to have that baby if you tested, but you, you have it, and now you expect help? That's a social expectation. You get to the point where Technology leads us so that we expect people won't have Down syndrome babies, and we expect them to justify the fact if they do. Now I'll take a time out here. It is possible, and it has been done, and it is being done. This is why I don't like to use the word ethics only here. To make an ethics, there is an ethics of seeking perfection. <coughs> Think about it, we've progressed. We have human beings have made so much progress and we can progress further. We can make more progress and we can do all these things that Cyril is talking about and we can actually make ourselves close to perfect. We can work towards perfection. It is possible to say that that is the good. That is an ethic. That is essentially, and this is not a criticism, it's just a fact. You can disagree, sir, all if you want, but that is essentially the ethic that science follows. They move endlessly towards perfection. Folks, is that a biblical ethic? Paul? <laughs> I think uh, I never hear that language in management, in business, in science. I never hear that term. I think, again, you're putting out something that is more of an argument. The, the term that I hear is continuous improvement. What's the okay. difference? The, the What's difference the difference? Is not I'm calling a spade a spade, Paul. Of course, of course they're going to try to make it sound very, very good. No, we're never going to reach perfection. The idea is 
Yeah. What, what can be, uh, like a business person would say, better, cheaper, faster? Something like that. All right, but we're not talking about necessarily better, cheaper, faster. We're talking about perfecting human beings. Yes. Um, in we well, you mentioned evolution before. Isn't evolution sort of a picture of that gradual movement toward better and better? Is it? Natural selection. <laughs> Is it, Chris? No, I would disagree. Darwin didn't, um, he uh, discussed evolution as survival of the fittest. And the fittest is not necessarily, it's the, it's the, the one that succeeds in that particular environment. It's not necessarily an improvement. Okay. And so it's not a quest for perfection. It's just, it's in a specific environment. Thank you. I, I do have to say here, think about the contrast between that particular phrase. Words are so important, as you pointed out, Paul. Survival of the fittest. What did I say is the biblical ethic? That we have compassion for those who aren't fit. Those are not in contradiction. Yeah, you can do that. That's right. That's very facile. Let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I have hold on a minute, Paul, because I want to do these two other examples having to do with social expectations. The two I've given so far, the one about, they're called designer babies, is actually happening on one level. So it is historical. The, you expect help because you had a Down syndrome baby. That could be historical, I don't know. I do not have uh, evidence of people having said that. It's hypothetical for me. But now I want to give two examples that definitely are historical. Again, having to do with the use of this technology and the development of social expectations, which obviously go away from the biblical imperative to care for the poor and the powerless. There was in 2012, an article in the American Journal of Bioethics in which two bioethicists argued that some parents may be morally obligated to use IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in order to avoid passing on genetic diseases or disabilities and to save the government money in health care expenses. I want to get my water glass while you uh, digest that. <laughs> you understand what I said? This is two, this is two bioethicists who are arguing that it should become the social expectation. This is not just, oh, it's so exciting, you can do that if you want. This is the idea that there should be social pressure, at the very least, to do it. <clears throat> and it went through a period, though, in history where we had forced sterilizations. That's uh, my fourth point. I'm getting to that. <laughs> I'm, glad. I'm glad you know that. Yes. Elise mentioned the Nazis. Now, how many others of you understand, but when you, when you, when you get to force, you're certainly talking about eugenics, which is, I will read you the dictionary definition, a science dealing with the improvement of hereditary qualities of a race or breed. And it is possible to say that short of force, the kind of thing that we're talking about here, could also be termed eugenics. How many of you are aware that in modern times, it was not just the Nazis who practiced this at its extreme, where force was used. Does anyone else know anything about it? Mm -hmm. yes. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. 28 states, including the Commonwealth of Virginia, had, beginning in 1907, laws that said that people in mental institutions 
should be forcibly sterilized. I, again, I don't know this history in detail. It is likely, however, people have made the connections. The guy that I read, the one reformed person who, who writes on this, has made the connection between the very first body of knowledge about genetics, Cyril, I hope you agree with this, which was Gregor Mendel, the monk, who discovered using his pea plants that qualities were inherited, heredity, the first body of knowledge about genetics. And lo and behold, Americans took this up and said, wow, talk about your social expectations. We got to expect that we're not going to have any more idiots. And in fact, <coughs> The, these laws in 28 states were challenged, and the, one of the cases went to the Supreme Court. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, in upholding these laws, said, and I quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. One historian has noted that Hitler used the language of the Virginia statute to write the law for Nazi Germany. The Nazis, there, I don't know how many people were sterilized in this country, but I do know that 7,000 people were forcibly sterilized in Virginia. The Nazis sterilized over 400,000 and killed many of them, I don't know how many. Virginia, uh, this, the, the Virginia sterilizations took place between uh, 1924, I think they passed their law, and 1979. The, the, the House of Delegates in Virginia voted in February, and I don't know if the governor signed this or not, it was in the post, but I haven't seen it since, to give $25,000 to the estate or to the individual sterilized. They estimate 11 individuals who were sterilized are still living uh, as a kind of a recompense for having donors. So that is a part of social expectations that come from undertaking to follow an ethic that does not insist on compassion and caring for the weak, the poor, the disabled, the powerless. Ruth? I think there is some compassion in sterilization now. If it's a genetic thing that is going to produce unhappiness for the person and for the child they would have. I think there is compassion in that. Not if they're doing it for the state to save money, but think about the families. Forcible, Ruth? Well, they, they probably... The law? They probably, the person probably doesn't have the wherewithal to make the decision if they're really an imbecile. So someone else has to be saying, is this person capable of having a child? And if, do we want another child that's like that one? I think there's compassion in that. I could be wrong, but to me there is compassion. Not if they say we're saving the state of Virginia. Bruce? Two points. Uh, that I think the poor will always be with us, regardless of whatever happens in what we're talking about. And therefore, the role of compassion in human beings will always be there. These are not contradictions. There will always be a, an opportunity for compassion and the injunction from our Christian heritage to make to use it as a point. <coughs> Second, in terms of forcibility, it comes very quickly to public health. And we see this in HIV, who are forcibly restrained from having sex with partners to whom they will give, unknowledgeable, uh, uh, give HIV infection. And in the case more recently of Ebola, people are isolated forcibly, forcibly, because they will infect the rest of society if they are not forcibly isolated. And I think the, the, the the linkage between what these these examples and what you're talking about is pretty close. Bruce, there are two problems here with what yeah. you said. Yeah. Uh, the question of force, I'm not talking about force in general. I'm the one who argued that there should be a law against maternal surrogacy. 
I believe that we live, it's also biblical, that we live in communities. We're not just individual autonomous people who make contracts, we make covenants with each other, and we have to have laws and we have to have moral suasion in communities to persuade each other. So the fact that you isolate people who have a disease, I don't think that's anywhere near what we're talking about here. We're talking about here a whole societal cast of caring for those who are not fortunate in one way or another. Your first point, that that will always be with us, I think that that is an extraordinarily wrong and dangerous view to take. History proves it is not true. Hist I, I would like, maybe I'll teach a lesson on this in, in Wrestlers in the Fall, because uh, you know I heard somebody say, when we had those little meetings about what, sitting around the table and talking about what, uh, what mission this church should have, and I talked about influencing legislation, and somebody sitting next to me and everyone agreed said, oh, our church doesn't take positions. If the church, if the early church in Rome, in the Roman Empire, had not taken positions with respect to compassion for women and children, we wouldn't have the ideas about caring for women and children that we have today. The Roman Empire didn't have that. If the church hadn't taken positions about slavery, where would we be today? That didn't exist, compassion for human beings when there was slavery, chattel slavery in this country. It's not a given. And it's not a given in the church either. Elise mentioned the Nazis, I mentioned the Nazis. Where was the understanding of compassion in the church? Those were German Christians that agreed with that. All the scientists, the Christian scientists, all practically all the German Christians that went along with it. Bonhoeffer was the leader of the confessing church. It was tiny, a minuscule number of German Christians said, hey, something is going wrong here with what we're doing. Every generation in the church has to work towards it. Sin, people, do you understand what sin is? I mean, this is what I was going to conclude with, and I'll say it right now, and we still have time for more questions and conversation. Who are we? Who are we to judge who should leave the face of this earth? Are we so good? If you think you are, why do you ever darken the door of that church? If we're so good that we can be the judge and call it compassion when we're judging, we're shot through with self-seeking, self-interest, every second of every minute of every day. Each and every one of us is dominated by that, and we have to ask God's forgiveness for it every day and struggle against it every day. And the church has to struggle against it, and in my view, it's not struggling against it anywhere near hard enough at this time in our history when our culture is dominated by self-seeking and self-interest. Elise. Um, I really appreciate your passion and I really appreciate what you were saying, but I have to stop and go back to what Bruce was saying. Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. But Jesus, you can't leave that phrase no, out, hanging out there. You have to see the context. What, what, you have to see the context. And so I, so I affirm what Bruce said. But I, I have to say that Jesus was pointing us to something greater. And I think you're saying that as you go on, that yes, the poor will always be with us. We have a ministry to the poor, and I affirm what you're saying in, in that. But we, it really is that we can't put these hard decisions into any one group's hands, especially without that Christian God perspective about life. And I just wanted to say that. I, I, you know, this is, this is some really hard stuff. I work in a hospital system, Johns Hopkins, where they're doing so much stuff right now, it would make your head spin. Um, I mean, with the things that they're doing, medical health care can be a very hostile environment. Only, I mean, you know, we all go to the doctor and, and we know that it's a place where people really, they're not simple answers. And so I just, I just want to say, hanging on to what Jesus said in the context of all of that, 
I think is where we'll find our victory and not to sum up things, but thank you thank for you. giving me say that. Sir, remember that case about three years ago where some nine-year-old wanted a kidney transplant and the law said you had to be 12. Yes. And there we had a committee, yeah. went to court. Uh, it's one thing to apply all this generally. It's quite another when it's your kid. Yes. Yeah. 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 Someone else, yes. Um, when I think of Jesus healing the lame man, I think I could think of it in the sense that here is someone who is lame. We should have compassion. We should help that person through his life as he is lame. We could also think, like Jesus, that he healed him so he could then not have this suffering in his life. I think we'll have some extreme cases where we are not doing the right thing. But to me, if there is a way with compassion to help heal, I think that's fine. That goes without saying. I started with that. Of course, and, and Cyril talked about it. Of course we use this technology to heal. Of course, that is part of the context. But as Cyril also talked about, there's another big thing on the table, and that is modification. That is the question of, I'll use your word, Paul, improvement, improving. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? That is what science pushes for, but that is not the Christian approach. That is not the biblical approach. The biblical approach is more complicated than that. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that I think recently there's been a lot of talk about you are, you're not the sum total of your genes, right? You're not just mechanic. <laughs> so the idea right. there's a lot of activity right. outside right. of influences right. of the genetic expression. That's is, a really good point. So as we think about somebody, we can't say you're going to become this because your genes do that. It's also about how you exactly people outside influence that. Right. Their environment influences that. So maybe it gets back to some of the a member of a community. Yeah. Uh, I just want to end with a, a statement, a cautionary statement by C.S. Lewis, since he's held in fairly high regard in this group. <laughs> C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis said, and you know, the ideas of perfect, perfecting and science improving, they're not new. It's been going on for a while, and C.S. Lewis, smart as he was, was very aware. And he said, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. All right, Cyril. So we're, we're tag team, so you've heard um, <laughs> a couple perspectives. Um, I might just add, in, from the technology side, um, the driving force for the testing is basically knowledge. Um, what you do with that knowledge, and, and this is a general question, is a, depends on wisdom and how you apply it. But knowledge by itself is generally something that people have sought after, and it's hard to see that that's a bad thing in terms of no, biblical it's reasons. It's not. It's not a bad thing. So, by no means. So I hope no one thinks I said that. So genetic testing is one issue. The second issue is modifications to fix an ailment. People take medications because they don't like allergies. People take medications because they don't like dying from stroke. People seek protections from anemia that will kill them. Whether it's a biological drug or whether it's a genetic modification for that particular person, people do that mostly, if it's serious, for compassion. Parents really don't like seeing their kids with hunting disease or other major ailments and they really anguish over the fact that they might give that to their children. That is a major problem. It's hard to see how addressing that wouldn't be a good thing to do. That may involve genetic modification for that particular person. Then it starts getting a little bit of question, well, are you being, are you have to do it? Or, you know, the questions of Downs testing is a, that's a, that's a very question, that's a ethical decision, but on the fixing a, genetic defect in a child, if it's fixable, may be something there's be less moral pushback on or biblical. You know, that is really compassion and just another tool you're using. The next step is the more controversial step is what happens if you're making a genetic modification in the gene pool? And it's less likely to be the government forcing you must make these changes and every one of you must have this little, that's very unlikely. 
But if a person says, well, I want to do it, I can afford it, I know the technology, I know the risk, should they be allowed to? That starts becoming an ethical question. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of the bottoms up, how does it get applied on a one-by-one -one basis, which is a lot different, I think, than the you know, top down, everybody's going to have be um, you know, sterilized or everybody's going to be thrown in a concentration yes, camp. Well, well um, and also, so what I said, will it technology. become, it's much more dangerous, will it become an expectation? Not that you're forced, but that the social pressure says, this is what we do. This is the way we live. And it may be different in Bethesda than it is in Kenya. Just that's just a worldwide impact. Yes. Sarah, so now it's going what up think, together. What do you think vaccination is? And forced vaccination for rubella. It's a genetic mm -hmm. modification of your white blood cells, so that when you get that red rubella bacteria, it will be kicked out, as and or you one of you said. And this is forced vaccination. Remember all the discussions? Virginia, and then there's the forced vaccination for papilloma. Ah now. It's trickier. The legislation that was passed for the four sterilizations existed because of social expectations. And People social wanted that to happen, hence the legislators voted for it. Chris? I think there's a big difference between mm -hmm. vaccination, which only affects the one individual and the group. Society. From, and your, that rubella um, vaccination is not transmitted in your sperm or egg to the next generation. And I, I think that's where I have the issue is I don't think human beings are smart enough to um, design evolution. <laughs> <laughs> nor are we, this is partly my point, nor are we selfless, generous, Caring enough. Well, I'm sure that. there's genetic modification for that too, right? Brent Reed used the term uh, seeking uh, social uh, perfection a uh, number of times, and I've been sitting here mulling what is social perfection? What would that be? And uh, I don't think we have any kind of clear notion at this point of just what kind of person we would design if that were within our power to come up with a perfect person. Or maybe there would be types A, B, C, and D, and you could choose, I don't know, maybe over several generations of working at this kind of thing, some kind of perfected person would emerge. But at this stage, you know, if each of us were to try to write down what we think the perfect person would be, uh, I think we would have a plethora uh, of opinions. Don, does and, uh, anybody know? Well, uh, I, I think you don't have to worry about that. Because yeah. the, the, the state of the science, even at the rapid development, is no place close to that. That's generations off. They're more fixing a particular flaw that somebody has or building a particular attribute. Um, nothing to deal with this kind of, you know, thinking or the idea of smartness is kind of like people are curious about it, but they don't know. And so a lot of that stuff just isn't possible and won't be possible for generations. But fixing ailments, I think, is the kind of the near-term focus of the science and the application. The genetic weaknesses, flaws causing disease um, is more the focus. And a lot of people raise that as an issue, and I think that is a legitimate thing to worry about some decades or centuries from now but it's not in your term, no one's how to do that. Well, the social expectations, as I pointed out, are starters. Small, but they're there. So this is a topic that could go on for a while. I know Paul <laughs> wants to wrap this up for the, you know, we're no wrapping up for the session, and Paul wants to wrap it up for the year. So uh, by all means, we're happy to chat afterwards about this. We haven't we fully resolved the issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys.